how Venezuela could become like Yemen, and a close call at Mar-a-Lago? All that's coming up on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, thanks for being a part of the podcast. Would you do me a favor? We've got some great stuff to cover today, and I think it's going to blow your mind, really. But if you've been following the podcast, would you just hit pause for a second and go to this link, bit.ly slash hotzonepodcast, and take 15 seconds and rate the show and leave a review if you're so inclined. It's cheap and easy for you to support uh, that all the stuff we're doing, and it'll help get our reporting out to lots more people. So I really appreciate it if you would do that. I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead. Good. Did you get it? Okay. All right. Thanks for doing that. Please uh, also share the show on your social media and all that. Every little bit helps. Okay. So I've been reading a lot about the ongoing war in Yemen, and we haven't talked about it much on the the hot zone. Uh, And part of the reason is because it's kind of confusing. But it struck me just how many similarities I'm seeing over there to what's going on in Venezuela. Uh, in, they say Yemen's the world's biggest humanitarian crisis and the biggest refugee crisis on the planet. More than 3 million refugees, 8.4 million at risk of starvation, and more than 75% of Yemen's population is in need of humanitarian assistance. Well, let's compare that with Venezuela. Both countries have about 30 million people. In Venezuela, at least 3 million are known to have left the country. But somebody explained to me when I was there last week that the, the 3 million figure is only the people who have left with a passport or other documents. The vast majority of the people leaving by way of the land borders to Brazil and Colombia don't have a passport or anything and because a passport costs the equivalent of several years at income of the average worker. And uh, one man I talked to said he wouldn't be surprised if there were over 10 million who have actually left Venezuela or will soon be leaving. So everyone you talk to says people are starving inside the country. We don't know how many exactly, but without a doubt, 75% of Venezuelans could definitely use some humanitarian assistance. This is without a doubt the worst humanitarian crisis in the Western Hemisphere, at least since the 2010 earthquake that destroyed the nation of Haiti. I was there, and uh, uh, it was very bad, but not as widespread as Venezuela is. The causes and problems of Venezuela and Yemen are are actually kind of similar as well. The problem in Yemen started from two rival political groups that were fighting over control of the country with outside countries like the United States and Saudi Arabia supporting one group and Iran and uh, Russia, et cetera, supporting the other. Iran seems to be very involved, if you think about it, in nearly every major humanitarian disaster around the world, whether it's Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Venezuela. Iran has its fingers in everything. The U.S. is involved in a lot of the same countries, but uh, it'd be hard to make a reasonable case that the U.S. influence is contributing to the suffering of millions of people. I mean, I know there are those who try to make that case, but it just doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. Now, Here's how Venezuela differs from Yemen. Venezuela has a year-round growing season, so those who live in the country can at least grow something to eat. I talked to a woman last week that said really all they had had to eat was salads for the last year, and they were feeding their babies uh, green bananas, plantains, that were boiled and then kind of made into a, a broth. Uh, The problem would be much worse in Venezuela if it was mostly desert like Yemen is. And Venezuela has tons of natural resources, you know, their petroleum and such, which Yemen doesn't have. What Yemen does have that Venezuela doesn't is a large influence by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other radical jihadist groups. And those only add to the misery of the civilians that are affected in, in Yemen. Uh, and it contributes to the fact that tens of thousands of people have been killed there by wars and airstrikes as well, because the United States and other countries are bombing those terror groups, and those terror groups don't care whether or not civilians are around their, their bad guys. Actually, they like to use civilians as human shields. We saw that a lot in Syria, and you see a lot in Yemen as well. And so, consequently, civil, a lot of civilians are getting hurt in this war. And not only that, but Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all of the other um, Houthi rebels and and all the other factions are really all fighting each other 
uh, as well as you know just the two major factions. In, within uh, the two major factions, there are groups that are all fighting each other. Everybody's killing everybody over there. It's just really bad. Now, we haven't seen that kind of violence yet in Venezuela, and I sure as heck hope that we don't, because obviously that would be absolutely horrific. Now, so far, the violence in Venezuela is more of the zombie apocalypse kind, people looting and robbing and stealing from each other, which to me is really concerning because once you see that kind of breakdown of civilization, it's hard to rein it back in once the situation stabilizes. I mean, I believe it'll take a generation to fix the cultural breakdown that we're seeing right now in Venezuela. A lot of Venezuelans agree with that. In well, my opinion, whether it's Yemen or Venezuela or anywhere else, what people really need is to know the love of Jesus. They need to come to follow that man who taught people to love one another and put others' needs first before your own. And he even sacrificed his life for us as an example of the extreme power of self-sacrificial love. Now, if everybody believed that, we'd, the world would be a much better place. There's no two ways about it. And uh, look, I realize that's just my opinion. You might have come here just for the news. Uh, look, suffice it to say that if everybody believed that uh, we should treat other people like we want to be treated ourselves, uh, this world would be a much better place. And I think it's hard to argue with that, no matter what your religious stripe is. All right, let's move on to an interesting and kind of concerning story out of President Trump's Winter White House, the Mar-a-Lago Resort in Florida, where he spends a lot of time golfing and resting and such. Uh, most previous presidents had, had their hideaways. Kennebunkport, uh, Camp David, the ranch out in, for the bushes out in uh, Texas. Uh, but whether it's a private home or a ranch where they went to get away, Trump's getaway is a functioning country club and hotel. Uh, which, as you can imagine, causes all kinds of headaches for the U.S. Secret Service. To talk about this more, I've brought on my good buddy Tim Miller, who's a former Secret Service agent and now the head of Lionheart International Services Group, of which I have a part, full disclosure. Uh, but Tim actually lives in West Palm Beach, Florida, and so it's fairly close to Mar-a-Lago. And uh, Tim, tell me a little bit about, first, what exactly happened with this woman at Mar-a-Lago? So, Chuck, apparently uh, a Chinese national uh, attempted to enter Mar-a-Lago, made it through the first outer ring of security, uh, made it into a reception area where she was further vetted for why she was there. Uh, as part of that vetting, the staff at Mar-a-Lago identified she was not on a guest list and notified the Secret Service. The Secret Service came and talked to her, uh, pulled her out, full, did a, an interview, a follow-on interview, to which she had uh, two separate passports, uh, some thumb drives which contained malware, uh, four cell phones, a laptop computer, and upon further investigation, the Secret Service determined that she had, in fact, falsely represented herself, uh, resulting in federal charges for attempting to enter a restricted area and what we call um, false official statements. Um, she's pending uh, judicial review uh, and has a bond, but obviously the Secret Service is running real hard right now trying to get to the bottom of why she was actually there. Yeah. Now, we, we, you and I both know that China is full court press right now uh, in right. espionage, both corporate and governmental and, and national security and everything. And so I guess the thing that just smells funny about this to me is that it seems like such a such a, a, a amateurish job. I mean, it's like something I would do. Uh, does it. I don't know. Do you, do you have any concerns that maybe it was a, a something to distract us from something else, or uh, what? What do you think was the the game plan behind this? Yeah, that's a, that's a great thought, um, Chuck. Because the bottom line is, it could be a head fake. Uh, the thing that's a little concerning about it is um, whoever it was that is behind this, and it may just be her. It, it doesn't appear that it's just her, but whoever it was that planned this didn't plan it well. Uh, Mar Lago is not your average place where you can bluff your way in. Uh, clearly, they hadn't done any homework in terms of penetrating the security, which makes it even more concerning. Because if you have an amateur that's able to do this, what does that tell you about? somebody who is truly professional. Um, I, I think the question, the $30 million question is, 
what was she really there for? Uh, you don't take, you know, your laptop and, you know, everything else to go to a pool. So it's very clear that her her justification for be there for being there fell apart pretty quickly. Uh, obviously, the investigators, um, you know, are pressing hard. Uh, they're working jointly with, you know, the national intelligence community, the FBI. And uh, I, I assure you that the Secret Service is going to get to the bottom of this. Um, but but for us on the outside looking in, there are a whole lot more questions at this point than answers. Yeah, well, we know they're the best at what they do, for sure. Uh, you know, it, it kind of makes you wonder. Um, it, it, Trump's winter White House there at Mar-a-Lago is different than all the other uh, kind of retreats that presidents have had in the past. And uh, it, talk about the, the unique security challenges of uh, having the president going and, and recreating in a place where there are it's actually a commercial enterprise. There are so many people there. Yeah, you're right, um, Chuck. When we would travel to Kenny Bunkport um, to to go to the Bush residence. It was all owned by the Bush and it was a residence. So it made it pretty easy to secure. Mar-a-Lago is unique. Uh, it's, it's unlike any other presidential site because it is a mixture of residence and an open community like you just outlined. I, I think the key, you know, for the Secret Service, uh, first off, the Secret Service, we're, we're not ticket takers. We don't vet guest lists. That's not what we do. Uh, what we do is make sure that the security of the area, wherever the president it is 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 highly uh, secure, and, and so the, the the unique feature of Mar Lago is you got all these people coming in for all these different events. And yet you, as in this case, you have the president of the United States that's going to be coming back. Now, let, let's don't paint a picture that's not accurate. The president's actual residence and locations is highly secure. But uh, as you pointed out, all these other buildings um, are, are adjacent, surrounding. So it creates all kinds of, of security concerns for the Secret Service. In this case, I think it's good thing, though, because it's really going to cause uh, the Secret Service and all of the Mar-a-Lago staff and security elements to go, well, wait a minute, how do we stop this from happening again? And, and you know, I was explaining to someone else, I think the good news when something like this happens and no one gets hurt or killed is there are great takeaways and it's actually going to, I think, improve the security of Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, I think so. There's some real opportunity there. And I, I would say Mar-a-Lago in general presents opportunity because it's a it's kind of a captive audience, a captive environment for the Secret Service to collect intelligence on the people who are, are getting close to the president. I mean, to become a member at Mar-a-Lago, it's a $200,000 initial investment and then 14000 a year, I think. And uh, so, I mean, it's not just anybody is going to be, be uh, present there, but we know that there are foreign nationals, there are uh, foreign uh, tour agencies, for example, that have, uh, you know, spaces there. And of course, these events where lots more people come. And so it seems like it'd be a target rich environment for collecting intelligence on the kind of people that are looking to get close to the president. We've also seen from China a lot of uh, intelligence collection uh in, they're, they're trying to collect intelligence by everything from uh, teapots with Wi-Fi snippers, sniffers in the handle to, to light bulbs with microphones in there that, that record all the sound in a, uh, at, say, a table at a restaurant or whatever, send it all back to China. Of course, they are actually becoming the leaders globally in AI, and that AI allows them to sift through just absolute mountains and shiploads of data. Uh, data and find the stuff that they want to find, again, whether it's uh, industrial espionage or national security related, doesn't matter to them. They're just looking for, a, a, for an advantage. Uh, talk about how we can, as a nation, what we need to be doing to counter that kind of an intel collection. Well, that's a great question because I think the answer is, is that the technology is developing faster than we can keep up with it. Uh, you point out very appropriately that, you know, devices 20, 25 years ago that would not never even be considered collection devices are now very much collection devices. And that highlights kind of a, a real challenge with the role of security in general. You know, if it, it used to be that, you know, if you were had a listening device, you had a whole suitcase full of equipment where now you may have a key fob. You may have something that is so innocuous, nobody notices it. And that's what's troubling about this attempt. Why would you take a thumb drive in with malware? 
what what possibly could you want to do with that? And that should cause everybody to be very concerned about this attempt because you know it's easy to say or discount it as that's a lost tourist. Um, obviously, the facts don't paint that picture. Um, she was there for a reason. Uh, the reason may have been as innocent as trying to, you know, collect information, collect, uh, you know, just information from a personal standpoint, or it could have been as complex as trying to in- introduce malware into a Mar-a-Lago system that I'm sure at some point is going to be problematic in terms of security as it relates to the president's data oh, system. Uh, say that again. I'm sure at some point. I, I forgot what I said. I said. I'm sure at some point is going to be problematic. Oh, yeah. I'm, sh- I'm sure at some point it's going to be problematic uh, with the technology being interlaced at, at uh, Mar-a-Lago with some of the White House communications and all the other things. So it, it, it should raise the alarm bells uh, from a technical standpoint uh, for those folks that are looking at it. Yeah, I imagine that uh, if you're a Chinese spy and you're saying, uh, you know, we, we can try to introduce malware to the White House or to Mar-a-Lago, obviously Mar-a-Lago is going to be the softer target no matter what. So uh, that's, you know, that's the reason that they chose that. But let's hope it doesn't go much further than that, or at least uh, the Secret Service learns a lot from that malware, being able to kind of reverse engineer it and figure out what they had in mind with all that, uh, that, that uh, it, for sure. One more thing real quick. Um, I saw that there was a, a story. You do a lot of church security training. There was a story I saw today uh, about a man that was arrested in the basement of a church in Iowa, I think, a Catholic church. Uh, He had several firearms on him. He had a bunch of ammunition and more firearms in his vehicle. His uh, 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 social media posts kind of uh, tip people off that he was about to go on a rampage. Did we just see uh, th- th- when the police arrested him, did we just see them avoid another massive church shooting? Yeah, I think, I, you know, the, the facts of the investigation are still coming out, but I, I think it's very likely that we did. Um, it, here's the reality, Chuck, when we point this out when we train folks. Security is very different than law enforcement. Security is about proactively making something not happen. Law enforcement is about responding to something that is happening. I, I think in this case, uh, that church is very fortunate uh, because when you kind of look at the facts, um, it clearly paints that a picture that either he was severely mentally ill or he was uh, planning an attack or both. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think the outcome could have been pretty horrific and yeah, they, uh, uh, they must have been praying a lot in that church well I you know their only security measures as far as I could tell from the story were a sticker on the window that said no guns allowed so obviously that didn't help a whole lot uh, and uh, you know if, if anything that's an advertisement for one of these whack jobs and uh, so uh, what in in lieu of a sticker what would you suggest that people do uh, and encourage their own churches to do when it comes to security well, you know, Chuck, we've had this conversation many times. I'm not a fear monger. I don't do that. But what I do is peddle wisdom and preparation. I think churches across the nation need to wake up. It's time for you to protect your congregation. Uh, I'm not saying that you have SWAT teams at every church, but I'm saying you have a security awareness program. You have some folks that are trained, that you do simple things like lock your doors. You put cameras in places. Uh, you have a, a, a responsibility as a shepherd. Uh, if you're leading as a priest or a pastor or any kind of spiritual leader, you need to protect your congregation, not just spiritually, but physically. And I think this is a season in the history of the church Church, where churches need to recognize the threat is real. It's not fear mongering. God still works by protecting his people, but he uses people to do that often. And so I think it's it's really important that you start with a basic plan and you say, hey, and I'm not just talking about violence. Does your church have a fire evacuation plan? Do you have a weather emergency plan? Do you have a plan to protect your children? Because if you don't have a plan, uh, likely you're not going to know how to respond when the crisis comes. And and so I think that would be the, the, the greatest piece of advice I'd give to churches. Recognize that it's part of your responsibility if you're leading a church to physically and spiritually protect your congregation. 
All right, well, thank you. Tim Miller, uh, the CEO of Lionheart International Services Group. That's L-H-I-S-G dot com, right? And yes, uh, so go go check it out. If you want somebody to come and give you some training for your church, uh, you need to call Tim and get a hold of him or get a hold of me and I'll help you get a hold of him. Uh, anyway, Tim, thanks for being a part of the Hot Zone today. And for all you watching, I hope you come back again tomorrow. Uh, thanks for being with us. This is Chuck Holton. And you've been watching the Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.